the big campaign to finally, finally uh, silence me or attempt to stop me. The, that month I received the second of what was ultimately to be five anonymous, absolutely disgusting smear letters about me. Okay. Uh, the, this particular one called me a part-time prostitute. And you can imagine how upsetting it is to open up something like that and, and read it. And um, the, during the same period of time, there were a large number of attempts to get into my apartment, which was on the ground floor of the building that I lived in at the time. It was not well guarded. I was quite concerned. I received a tremendous number of really disgusting calls. I remember one day counting 11 calls. Remember that I work as a freelance writer. That means that if I get upsetting calls, and so uh, I'm unhappy. It's very hard to just pick up and continue writing what you're working on. A lot of nuisance calls uh, then and over the years, just this sort of you pick up the phone and someone says, oh, what are you doing? And, you know, you've got to hang up and then they call back and so you have to take the phone off, excuse me, you have to take the phone off the hook and then if you're trying to interview somebody, they can't call you back. Well, I finally decided I was going to move to a higher security apartment, uh, even though I really could not afford to do so at the time. I moved on December 15th. On um, December, the person who took over the apartment uh, was my second cousin. Uh, we, uh, we bore a physical resemblance, but uh, basically because we were about the same age and she was very petite and we both had short brown hair at the time. And a series of mysterious circumstances occurred. The important thing was that she opened up the door to someone um, who had flowers and rang my bell. And I was no longer living there, although my name was still on the door. And uh, I, Eddie Walters told you about R245 and you've heard of the policy. Uh, the, when Joy opened the door to get these flowers, he unwrapped the gun, excuse me, he unwrapped the flowers and there was a gun in it. And he took the gun and he put it at Joy's um, temple. And he cocked the gun and we, we don't know whether it misfired, whether it was empty and it was a scare technique, or what happened. But somehow or other, the gun did not go off. And the, he started choking her, and she was able to break away, and she started to scream. And the person ran away. And uh, she called the detective, and he said, it's a very odd attack because there doesn't seem to be any motive for it. And there was no attempted rape, there was no attempted robbery, and why should somebody just suddenly uh, try to kill her? The, about a week or two later at my new apartment, I received a visit from the FBI, and they informed me that the public relations person for Scientology had claimed to have received a couple of bomb threats and, asked, and had named me as somebody likely to send bomb threats. So the, I didn't take the whole visit very seriously and the FBI asked me if I would mind being fingerprinted and I said that I would not and was fingerprinted. At the same time, my cousin Joy's boyfriend had been very, very upset about what happened and he said, boy, you better let your Scientology spies know that you have moved and where you are because I don't want anything to happen to her again. And I did and shortly thereafter in my, uh, to my new building, Half the tenants, which is approximately 300 tenants in the building, received a very, very disgusting anonymous smear letter about me trying to get me kicked out of the apartment and saying that I had venereal disease, that I had sexually molested little children. Uh, the only thing that was true in the letter was my age, which was not something I wanted known anyway. <laughs> and it was very, very embarrassing. I was walking through the building and I, I heard people talking about me in the elevator and I was just sort of slinking along and I was really... A month later, uh, my parents received an anonymous smear letter about me, um, accusing me of practicing sexual perversions with their clergymen. These were not very good months, so when I was called before a grand jury around this time, at least I didn't think this was anything very serious and did not bother to retain a lawyer. I uh, had very little money because I had used all my money to move to this more expensive, higher security apartment. And when I got there, they told me that I was the target of an investigation into the bomb threat. And I went and had to hire a lawyer. And every lawyer wanted, the least we could get was $5,000 retainer, which in those years was like paying $10,000, you know, today. 
and to suddenly have to pay this sum of money and find out that you're in serious trouble and no one would, the, the government would not tell my lawyers what the evidence was against me. Uh, they wouldn't show me the letters. Anyway, finally I went before uh, the grand jury and I tried to answer every question as truthfully as I could and never took the Fifth Amendment. And they kept asking me again and again, did you ever see this letter? Did you ever touch it? Do you know who might have? Uh, and I said, incidentally, yes, that I suspected that Meisler might have sent it to himself because we'd had some unpleasant confrontations in the press. And uh, then they asked me to step outside of the room. And so uh, when I came in, I knew I was in very serious trouble. They asked me what my social security number was, whether I was on drugs, and did I realize what I'd said so far. And again, they asked me the same series of questions. And then they said, well, Ms. Cooper, if uh, you've never touched this letter before, uh, could you tell us how your fingerprint got on it? And I, I felt like a grand piano had just hit me on the head. I, the, I, I fainted sitting up. The whole room just turned upside down. I didn't know what to do. And then, of course, the lawyers wanted more money. And uh, on May 9th, uh, excuse me, May 19th, 1973, I was indicted on three counts of sending bomb threats through the mail. Uh, two counts were for the two letters. One was for perjury for saying before the grand jury that I hadn't done it and that I thought that this public relations person might have done it. On May 29th, 10 days later, I was arrested and I was arraigned. The next eight months were uh, a terrible, terrible nightmare in my life that I still feel sometimes that I suffer from to this day. I had uh, 15 years in jail over my head, $15,000 in fines. I was petrified of going to jail, uh, more so perhaps because of my small frame and the fact that I heard that women's federal prisons were rough places. I risked having my career totally destroyed because, and I had been successful, and as a freelance writer, uh, what editor is ever going to give an assignment to someone who's been indicted or convicted for sending bomb threats to someone they exposed? I was very concerned about the indictment and the trial coming out in the newspapers. The public does not know the difference between indict and convict. And they think that if you're on trial for something that you must have done it or where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, I felt that there, it would be terrible public humiliation that every person I ever knew in New York to read all the details of the trial and these accusations. I was most concerned about my parents who had adopted me when I was six years old and how humiliating it would be for them and their friends to have to explain and to go through a, a trial like this. All, during this period of time, I went into a terrible, terrible depression and a number of my friends, which I can't blame them for, did not stick by me. I was depressing to be with. Uh, I had been seeing a man for five years and had intended to marry him, and he left as a result of my depression. I was, had been released on my own recognizance, but I was not allowed to leave the state. And this made it difficult because I had friends in Connecticut and New Jersey, and to just all I wanted to do was get away for a weekend. But it was so humiliating to have to go to the court and ask permission to uh, go 20 miles away that uh, I couldn't do it. I went through a period of very, very acute anxiety. I would uh, go to sleep. I couldn't fall asleep till about four in the morning. And then I'd wake up about six with my stomach just right underneath my throat and worry about what the next day would bring and what was going to happen on the legal hearings. And uh, this went on for eight months and I was just totally exhausted sleeping two to four hours a day. I couldn't even drag myself around anymore. All of the money I had had gone to lawyers, and I went into debt to try to continue to pay for them. The, in the end, just the main lawyers cost $19,000. I was totally unable to write during this period. Obviously, you know, the, the depression was very, very bad, and I couldn't concentrate. I attempted to write, but it was really very bad writing. And uh, I'd stopped eating because I was filled with such nausea and exhaustion. I would try to force myself to have... Uh, I had a 16 ounce glass of Clamato juice each day and two eggs. Uh, about half of the time I would just eat it and then go to the bathroom and throw it up. I just couldn't hold food in my stomach. Uh, a year earlier I'd been operated on and